Hello, and welcome to We'll Tell You What We're Reading, the monthly show where we, the staff of the Waltham Public Library, tell you what we're reading. I'm Liz Rior. I'm the Collection Development Librarian here at the library. And joining me as usual are many of my wonderful colleagues. We don't have any Greg today, but we have another staff member that I'm so excited to have here for the first time. So get, get ready, buckle up. Uh, so we have Amber Harvey, Louise Goldstein, and Kathy Messier. So everyone from the other side of your screens, big welcome to Kathy for being here today. Uh, as always, we have a lot of great virtual programming going on at the library and in-person programming returning slowly as well. Um, a lot of which, a lot of our uh, programs are featured on YouTube. So go ahead and like, subscribe, hit the alert bell, send your carrier pigeon out so that you get notifications, whatever YouTube is asking you to do now. Um, and you will get the notifications about upcoming events. Uh, we do a lot of interactive programs on Zoom and we have book clubs on Zoom and in person. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you what the ones coming up are. Um, on Monday, August 8th, we have a virtual program. The link is on our website. Tell us what you're reading. Uh, that's where you, the patrons, the viewers attend and tell us what books, movies, TV shows you're really getting into or you've read and decide you hate. Um, on Saturday, August 13th, our Saturday morning book club will be discussing This Is Your Mind on Plants by Michael Pollan. And that's at 10 a.m. and it's in person. On Monday, August 15th at 7 p.m., the Science Fiction and Fantasy Book Club, which is led by Greg. Oh, I should mention uh, the Saturday Morning Book Club is led by Amber, who's participating. So come. Uh, all right, Monday, August 15th at 7 p.m., uh, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Book Club will be talking about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adam, a classic. And then on Wednesday, August 17th at 7 p.m., the Wednesday Night Book Club, which is led by Louise. Um, we'll be discussing What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam Chancy. So for all well, blah, 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 for all Waltham Public Library programs, sorry about that, please visit our website for more information and to get Zoom links when applicable. And as always, big, big, big shout out to the friends of the Waltham Public Library. Um, they are one of the best friends groups I've ever been able to work with. And I've worked at several libraries. They are truly fantastic. They uh, fund our Zoom account and other programming related expenses here at the library. So please consider joining the Friends memberships, I believe, start at $10 for an individual. Um, and they're just a lovely group of, of folks. and we're, we're so happy to have them. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Amber. And Amber, take it away. Thanks, Liz. I will start sharing my screen here. And go ahead and start with my first book, which is The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. This is a debut novel by Mr. Harris. It was an Oprah pick. It was long listed for the 2021 Booker Prize. It was a favorite of former President Obama's uh, last summer when he does his summer reading list. It's set in a small Southern town after the Civil War and immediately after the Emancipation Proclamation. It tells a story of George, who is an aging landowner. He inherited his farm from his father, who was originally from up north. So the family's never been fully considered a Southern family. George has this farm that he has never really used as a farm because he hasn't had to because of his inheritance. But as he, um, he, he has this idea that he wants to start a farm and he is going to hire some of the newly freed men to work on it and he's going to pay them a wage and so even though the emancipation proclamation freed the enslaved people the idea to pay them a wage was just unheard of and not taken favorably from george's community and um, other landowners so it tells the story of george it also tells the story of Landry and Prentice, who are the two black freedmen who agree to work for George and help him get a farm started. He wants to farm peanuts and um, they accept his wage and they're gonna live in his barn while they're working. They just temporarily to get him started, agree to this and they're gonna live in his barn. Um, it's also a story of George's son, Caleb, who is a Confederate soldier who was killed in action knowledge that George doesn't immediately share with his wife, who um, a, fact, a feature that also focus, or comes into play in the story. So it's 
um, a story about the town's reaction to George's what they consider just, you know, peculiar and unacceptable behavior. The story of um, what we learn more about Caleb, um, story about the town and some of the other people in the community. And it's just really, uh, the writing is tremendous. It's, you know, a complex story of the post-war South. His, Mr. Harris's writing just leaps off the page and, you know, very vivid and very well-drawn characters and just very lyrical and beautiful. And it's really, it's a, we read this for the Saturday morning book club and we always have a great discussion, but this one was received very favorably by all of the people that came to talk about it. So um, it's a great, it's a great read. And then my second story, or my second book is Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. And I had kind of been I'm in between books and I thought, you know, it's the summer, I'm gonna pick a beach read, you know, not too light, but I need something not heavy, just something kind of easy going to kind of get me reading. And I went to browse the shelves and instead of a beach read, I picked up this, which is nearly 600 pages. And it's the latest by uh, Jonathan Franzen, who I believe the only other book by him I've read is Crossroads, which may have been his first one. I think it was also an Oprah pick, but there was some controversy because he didn't want her name on his book. Um, anyway, Cr Crossroads tells the story of the Hildebrands. It's set in suburban Chicago in 1971, I believe, the early 70s. And it, it's about Russ, who's an associate minister who's harboring resentment towards the younger, cooler youth minister who took over the youth group, which is called Crossroads, um, after Russ was kind of ousted by the kids who did not want him to lead the group. His wife, Marion, who is overweight, unhappy, and sneaking to see a psychiatrist on the sly. Um, and it's funny because I'm nearly 200 pages in and I'm just meeting Marion for the first time. And it's about their four children, um, Clem, who is a college student, who has decided to drop out and um, end his deferment from the Vietnam War, um, kind of a move that seems to be mostly just to kind of spite his father, who he believes is not a very strong person after the whole, you know, being kicked out of the youth group, didn't sit well with Clem, and he now sees his father as a weak man, and so he's going to let the, you know, fate, let fate take its course and be drafted to the war. Uh, Becky is Clem's sister. She's socially at the top of the food chain. She joins Crossroads just to impress a boy, even though her, to her father, this is an extreme betrayal. Perry is whip smart, but has some social awkwardness, um, maybe some not, all, not, not great moral intentions. He's selling drugs to seventh graders. And the fourth child is Judson, who's the youngest and again, nearly 200 pages. I haven't met Judson yet other than to hear about him in passing. So um, I am in that, you know, this is, we'll tell you what we're reading. So I'm not finished with this one yet, but um, I'm gonna keep going. It's drawn me in, it's a family saga. And uh, Franzen has said, this is the first in a planned trilogy, which I think is highly ambitious and certainly has piqued my interest into um, how the trilogy trilogy will play out, whether it's going to continue, you know, we learn more about the family down the road or whatnot, but perhaps I will talk about the second half of this book, or the, I guess I'm only a quarter into it, but um, it's definitely maybe not a beach read, but I'm enjoying it nonetheless. So those are my two, two shares today, and now I am going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Amber, and thanks everyone for welcoming me as a longtime fan of the show. I'm really glad to be a part of it now. Um, and I'm always fascinated, by the way, you called it a beach read at the beginning of your review, Amber, and I just love people's like very different definitions of what a beach read is, because to me, it's like a gossipy, like light book or like a quick thriller. And I actually really like Franzen's books, but they're like, a thousand pages and very dense and I feel like you have to like work um to get through it but I mean hey if you want to read it at the beach that's awesome <laughs> um all right I'm gonna share my screen
My first book is Women Talking by Miriam Chaves. This was published in 2018, and it's been on my list since then. I've seen it make the rounds um, a lot. I will confess that the reason it got bumped to the top of my list is because the movie adaptation is coming out in December, and it stars a lot of my favorite actresses, including Frances McDormand and Claire Foy from The Crown. Um, so I'm very excited to see that. I have no idea what it was about before I read it. And now I will um, just give some trigger warnings because this is a bit of a tough read. So trigger warnings for sexual assault and domestic violence. This is actually based on a true story um, between I think the years of 2005 and 2009, a group of women in a remote Mennonite colony in Bolivia were waking up in the morning bruised and disoriented and they were told by the leaders in their community that it was either women's hysteria or um, that it was demons that were punishing them for their sins. And it was later discovered that there were a group of men who were um, using cow anesthetic on them and assaulting them several times a week for years. And the victims range from little children to elders. So when this was discovered, the a group of eight men were removed um, and arrested. And usually in these colonies, which I have since learned, um, any crime is dealt with inside the community, but this was too big. And and it's also noted that they were removed for their, for their safety um, because there was obviously a lot of a lot of rage in the community, to put it lightly. Um, so this novel is a fictionalized um, response to these events. And um, so Women Talking refers to these meetings that a group of eight characters, but they're representing many more women than that. And, and it's clear in the novel that there's more women present, but the focus is on eight women. And they're talking about what they're gonna do, um, how they're gonna respond. So they are pretty much given the choice of deciding if the men should be banished from the community, if they should leave or if they should stay in a fight. And so the entire novel is minutes of their meetings. And this is where I can see why some people, um, based on reviews that I've read, have issues with the novel because the whole novel is narrated by a man. And that's because the women can't read or write. And so they've tasked a male character um, to write everything down. So the novel is like their actual, it's pretty much like transcripts of their conversations. And I actually, I so sometimes when I'm reading a novel, I'll listen to the audiobook as well and I'll sort of switch back and forth. When I was reading the physical um, novel, I didn't have as much of an issue with the male narrator um, because he's pretty much reporting what's going on. Um, but when I was listening to it on audio and it, I just hear this man's voice the whole time, like I couldn't make it past five minutes. Um, it felt jarring that this is about what happened to these women and you only hear a man's voice. So your mileage may vary with this. Um, you might not have, a, have an issue with it, but this is a common um, issue that people have with the novel. And another thing is he has a crush on one of the women and so he's trying to do the transcripts, but like sometimes he'll react to something she says with like a little exclamation mark if like she threw him a bone or like said something he said was funny. Um, so that's a little annoying at times, but overall, I really, really enjoyed the novel. Um, there's a lot of clashing of personalities. Um, it gets darkly funny at times, like there's women that don't like each other and it kind of reminded me of Beloved by Toni Morrison, which is a, it's a really dark novel as well. And you're just reminded that often in the most um, life or death devastating of situations, like there's still humor that bubbles up. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's dark. Um, I would say if you're sensitive to any of the content that I've shared, I think it's worth noting that because these are transcripts, you never really get any like graphic um, depictions of any of the attacks. You, they are obviously referred to, but it's not as explicit as it would be in another novel. Um, but yeah, I, I recommend it and I'm looking forward to watching the movie. And the last thing I'll say is that I think it's definitely worth noting that Miriam Taves um, is a daughter of Mennonite parents. And so she's she's drawing from a, an actual connection that she has with these communities. Um, yeah, so that's that one. And then my next one is We Do What We Do in the Dark, which is a relatively recent novel. I think it came out this year by um, Michelle Hart. And this one is about an affair that a freshman woman in college has with a um, with someone who works at her college. Now, I will say um, that usually I don't like this kind of premise, uh, especially when it's like a student with a professor. I just feel like it's like a tired, I don't know. I it's always the same thing to me, except for The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, which is a novel that I love, but that's not a college novel. But anyway, the reason that I picked this one out is because of a beautiful review by Drew Gregory and Otto Straddle, which, um, in which she talks about how it's not really about the affair. Um, and she's right, it's not really about the affair. The affair takes place in like a third of the novel and it's really about the protagonist loneliness and her grief so at the opening of the novel she's um she's reeling from her mother's death and I'm just a barrel of joy with my first ever <laughs> um meeting here yeah these these are this one's not as dark but it's very much about her processing her mother's death and so she's in a really vulnerable place when she meets this woman for the first time and um and it's really about how this pretty short-lived affair lasts a couple months shapes the rest of her life um or at least the novel kind of ends when she's in her late 20s and she's reflecting on the affair and it's i don't even know how to um articulate that i just think it's such a great depiction of these relationships when the younger person is in a way different um, part of her life and the relationship will have just an elevated meaning um, above the woman who works at the college for whom it was just like running around. Um, I just thought it was great. Oh my gosh, I just um, wanted to share this very quick segment from Drew Gregory's review that I just think represents um, what I got out of it. So she says, when we're young, we relate to older people who are themselves young. We read maturity where it is not deserved. We think if someone is older and we're similar to them, then we must seem older too. We rarely consider that they're meeting us more than we're meeting them. We rarely consider that we can achieve more than what our models have modeled. So I just think, um, I don't know, that really spoke to me and um, hit home in a few ways. And it makes you like kind of grateful for like, like you could have gone down that road very easily not being in your thirties and looking back to like how special you felt when like a smart adult um, said like, oh, you're so mature for your age. And that just takes on a very different meaning when when you're older and, and just thinking back to those interactions. Um, so yes, those were my two books and I recommend them both. I don't know if I even said that I liked the book, but I did. Thank you, Kathy. They both sound really interesting. I read a book by um, Miriam, T I don't know how to pronounce her name. T Taves. Taves. That I really yeah, I'm glad really I looked like. that up before. <laughs> um, yeah, she's a very good author. Um, 
I'm That's sorry, fun. Louise. I meant to pass it on to my wonderful. Oh no, I, I I just jumped in there. So, <laughs> but um, I really like that author, and the other book sounds very interesting too. And Amber's book sounded really Sweetwater in particular sounds very interesting to me. I I think I read the corrections by Jonathan Franzen um, many years ago. I think I liked it. It was it was a long time ago though, um, so it's good to think about him again. Anyway. Onwards. Um, let me just back this up. Okay. So the first novel I wanted to talk about is called Z. It's a novel of Zelda Fitzgerald. It's by Teresa Ann Fowler. Um, interestingly, I don't know why. I just assumed Teresa was very young and I don't know why. But she's not. She's more like my age. She's a little older than me. She's like in her 60s and apparently has been writing for a very long time. Um, and she's also British, which I also didn't know until I looked her up. So that's those are interesting to me. Um, and she's won a lot of prizes for her writing, including the O. Henry Prize for some of her short stories, the BBC National Short Story Prize, um, uh, I think I wrote down some other prizes. Um, the 2016 Hawthorne Den Prize, um, the Wyndon Campbell Literature Prize for Fiction. So she's won a lot of prizes is my point. So she's a, a good writer. She also teaches writing. She studied creative writing, teaches creative writing. She did a lot of work about Henry James, which is hard work because his novels are pretty dense. Um, I only read The Golden Bowl, but it was pretty dense. Um, so I chose this novel because I've always been interested in Zelda Fitzgerald and Scott, um, F. Scott, who's actually uh, was related to Francis Scott Key. That might've been an uncle of his or something, which I did not realize, um, who made us suffer through the Star Spangled Banner all of these years, which is not a great gift. And <clears throat> sorry, to anyone who loves that, that's great. I just think musically, it's not my favorite. Okay, enough of that. Now, let's get back to Zelda. So Zelda is such an interesting character, such a complicated character. Um, I actually would like to read more about her now, uh, maybe read some of her works. I mean, because interestingly, um, you know, she was married to F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is kind of part of the jazz age, you know, they were friends with Ernest Hemingway kind of famously, um, but uh, Zelda is so kind of complicated. She's so talented. I mean, she actually, some of her works, uh, F. Scott uh, published under her his name, some of the things she wrote and things that they co-wrote, some short stories that they co-wrote were published under F. Scott Fitzgerald's name. Um, I don't know what that does to somebody's mental health, but I don't think it's so good um, for mental health. And, that you know, this book talks about some of the times in their marriage when, um, like when they were living in Paris, like she had like kind of nothing to do. They had nannies for Scotty, their daughter, and um, whose full name, I believe, was Francis Scott Fitzgerald <clears throat> also. So, so there, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's kind of like the man's world that we're dealing with here. And I think that may have, I mean, I'm not a therapist, but I think it may have affected her mental health because you've got the nannies for the daughter. She herself has talents and gifts. I mean, to be fair, those two are out drinking a lot. <laughs> and I don't know what that does. They're drinking and drinking and drinking. He's an alcoholic. He's a, he's, he, you know, that's what's gonna kill him. Um, spoiler alert. Um, down the line, um, but you know, they're out and about and dancing and they have such wonderful times, but of course, you know, they also have some terrible, difficult times. And she um, gets really into ballet at one point in France and she actually gets an offer from a, a small ballet company in Italy to, to dance with them because she's dancing so well. And her husband's like, no, no, you can't do that, no, no. And she's like somebody I could take Scotty with me whatever he's like no no can't do that you're the wife and and then later um Zelda does end up you know hospitalized uh 
later on. And, you know, they she depicts this French doctor telling her, the problem was you weren't playing the role, you weren't filling your role of wife and the mother. You needed to be a wife and mother. You're out there dancing. You know, it's like nauseating to hear this. And um, she sort of has to play along. So um, I know this is a complicated story. And um, what I love about this book, though, even though I don't think we have all the complications, and even some of the critics talk about we don't have all of the minutia of what happened to Zelda. And I'm not sure any of us will ever totally understand that. I mean, she definitely loved Scott. He definitely loved her. There's no question about that. Um, but what I love is um, kind of like in the book, The Paris Wife too, which is about uh, Hadley, um, Hemingway's first wife, is that we're getting this told through the story of the woman or like the book Ahab, Ahab's Wife, where we actually get a book through Captain Ahab's wife. Um, I love that premise of having the wife talk. We're getting it in her voice. Um, I love this about fiction anyway, that we we get to go into the heads of other people, not literally into their heads, but we get to hear the thoughts that are in their heads. I find that so wonderful. Um, uh, I have a sort of a trigger warning about this book, which is that when we when we start out, Zelda Sayre is about 17 years old. She's in Montgomery, Alabama. She's the daughter of a judge and a Southern Belle kind of a woman. And um, they have help, you know, they have black people for help who actually say things like yasm when they order them around. And, and the father, the judge talks to, and I didn't think of this as part of the novel, but the father, uh, the judge talks to Zelda about what a proud tradition we have in the Confederacy. And, you know, I mean, I know this is true about her family, but it's it's kind of horrifying to see it. You know, I found it a little bit, little bit horrifying. So just to give you that warning, but it is probably how she grew up. Now, that aside, she's a very interesting character. She has I think in some ways she's a bit of a feminist, um, whether she called herself that or not, I think she was, and she had a lot of spunk. I think Scott probably did the best he could. And I think he was always under a lot of pressure. And this idea of the man has to be the earner, the woman has to be the sort of, I don't know, embellishment. Um, I don't know, I find that a little nauseating. Sorry, I'm, I'm editorializing a lot today. I don't know why, but anyway. I really recommend this book. Very interesting to read about Scott and Zelda, particularly Zelda in this case. And next, talk about a cheerful book. Here we go, okay? Um, this book is called Cabin Fever. This is a 2022 book. And uh, the minute I heard about it, I was like, because I'm such an upbeat person, I was like, I have to read this. <laughs> um, I remember hearing about this ship um, on the news. I remember hearing about this uh, cruise ship, the Zandam, which is part of the Holland America line, which is owned by Carnival Corporation, and how um, nobody would take the, the ship because people had COVID on the ship. And um, just the idea of people being on this cruise ship, you know, kind of stuck and nobody's taking them and they're in isolation, they're in lockdown, they're in their rooms. And to read about it, it's very well written. These two authors really did a good job. It's kind of like keeping you on the edge of your seat. It's kind of like, um, I, I don't know what to, to compare it to in terms of books. Um, I started to say law and order, which is probably not a good analogy but you know how in law and order you kind of i was the original law and order i'd be kind of glued to what was happening um uh that's probably not a good analogy but it's very gripping and very well told i'll give it my highest compliment it reads like fiction because to me fiction is often the most interesting um writing and this is very interesting and gripping. We start at the beginning of the cruise. We have everybody getting on the cruise. It's about, um, I don't know if it was like about March 6th or so. So there was talk about COVID going on, but um, Holland America makes the decision that it's okay. It's okay. They're going to be in South America. There are not that many cases in South America, very few. 
the worry, you know, supposedly they're going to have a very careful questioning of, have you been in China, you know, take everyone's temperature. But in fact, they weren't very careful. Um, there was someone on the ship who actually had just been to China and um, he's playing bridge with one of the passengers. And this book is very well done because they, they actually interviewed a lot of the people who had been passengers on the line. And so we, we get a lot of kind of direct quotes from people who are passengers and crew. Um, one kind of stunning thing about it, I felt is the sort of, I don't know if this is a fair analogy, but the kind of upstairs, downstairs uh, life that's going on on a cruise ship. You have the passengers and then you've got this huge army of people. I mean, I think it was like, I can't remember, it was about 12,000 people. I can't remember if that's right or if it was 12, no, it was 1800 people. I wrote it down luckily. It was 1800 people on the cruise ship, not 12,000 and 600 crew members. So you have like one crew member for every three people on that ship. So that's a huge crew. A lot of the crew, you know, they came from places like Indonesia, maybe Thailand. And crew people are often working, you know, 11 hour days. And we have some direct talk about some of the crew. Um, the One of the crew people was in the laundry room and he's working like 11 hour days and he's from Indonesia. And he's doing this, even though he's away from home for so much of the year, he's doing this to get money for his wife and children. And he's kind of proud of his job and he's very much into his religion. And he's one of the people who ends up getting sick on the ship. And the, the ship is kind of, because of the corporate culture, um, they're not wearing masks, they're, people are getting sick and they're still doing things. They're still going on masks into the, you know, to the big rooms for shows and eating together. You know, they, they only start taking precautions a bit late in this, in this cruise ship. So you can see there were things that were not being done so well um, from the corporate side of things um and but people did kind of try to move heaven and earth once people were really getting sick to try to help to get help for the for the people in the ship but one thing that i noticed is that noticed is the passengers there's more push to help for the passengers than for the crew and so this sort of classist issue was a little painful to see. Um, it's a really gripping book. Um, even though it's grim, you've got a cruise ship, you've got people getting sick, some of them did die. Um, it's still uplifting to see all the many people who try to help, all the diplomats, all of the, even Carnival at some point starts being more proactive and, you know, people who are brave enough to get on the ship to um, help out on the ship. There are volunteers who come to help because the crew members are getting so sick and, and they put everybody on lockdown. And so everyone's stuck in their rooms. Can you imagine? And some of them have rooms with no portholes, very small rooms. Sometimes it's husband and wife in a very small room. They don't know when this thing is going to end. You know, they have phones, they have the little TV, but one of the the crew who liked to lead exercises couldn't even exercise. So she did this thing like get fit while you sit or something like that. And they put it on the TV for people, but it's, it's so difficult. And some of the people um, uh, take the crew, take this job to like answer people's calls, you know, and people are getting desperate. So they're taking these very difficult calls. Like if you don't do something, I'm going to throw my husband overboard is one of the calls. And so they, the woman keeps them on the phone while some of the medical people come. And, you know, this ship is, is equipped. There's only one ventilator. I mean, they have more, many more uh, staff for the casino than they do for the medical area. And so they have one ventilator and a limited amount of oxygen. And so they have to get oxygen delivered by this other ship who has to get to them called the Rotterdam. And at some point, which is kind of almost like a mirror image of, of the Zandam, and they, they take well people off the Zandam. And this one couple wants to get off, but because the guy has uh, sleep apnea and has to use um, 
oh, what do you call the thing? He's, he has to use the, the thing for sleep apnea. They say there might be germs on your sleep apnea thing. So they don't let the couple get off even though they're not sick. So it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, most of the people get out, but some of the people do pass away. It's, it's a very riveting story. Um, I recommend both of these books. I, I really liked them both. And with that, I'm going to stop my share. All right. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your books. I do not have any books to share this week um, because I recently moved and have not had any time to read, but I'm glad I got to hear everyone's. So now we're going to open up the floor to discussion um, of uh uh, books, movies, TV shows, et cetera, that we've been into. We'll talk about that briefly. And then, um, yeah, then we'll head out for the day. So who would like to mention anything? Feel free to just jump in. If not, I'll start. I'll start. Um, so if you're my friend, you have been getting annoyed by, on a daily basis, by me begging you to watch For All Mankind on Apple TV+. Plus which in my opinion is the best show on TV right now. And during the pandemic, I have watched a whole lot of TV. So it's the winner among like dozens of TV shows. Um, so the basic premise is that you, it's about astronauts in outer space, specifically NASA. Um, and it opens up with everyone at the bar and at NASA headquarters, like watching first man on the moon and you think it's going to be Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin but then the astronaut lands on the moon and starts speaking in Russian and it turns out that the Russian cosmonauts are the first men on the moon in this version of reality um so I'm watching this and I'm like who cares <laughs> like I I don't like, what does it matter who got there first and I'm like bored but I keep watching because my best friend promised that it gets better um, so I will say as a um, heads up, the first two episodes are your very like standard cookie cutter prestige drama. drama. And if I hadn't had like assurance that it was going to get interesting, I would not have watched past the first episode. It's about all these like, you know, manly men astronauts who are like mean to their wives. And I'm just like, truly, if you know me, there's like nothing's further from what I would be interested in watching. At the end of the second episode, it um, pivots dramatically from that premise. And so the basic, basically the premise is when Russian cosmonauts get to the moon first, everyone at NASA is reeling and it sets off a space race and it keeps escalating. Um, so that goes in directions that you really don't see coming from the way the show starts. And so in, it's really in the last like two minutes of the second episode that you're like, oh, this is what the show is actually gonna be about. And the characters that we've met so far, they're still very much a part of the story, but they're um, sort of just a few puzzle pieces in this like much broader, um, tale that's it's not um I don't want to spoil too much because it's like a big reveal but it's not a show that's like about white straight white men um it's I mean first of all sci-fi is not really my genre to begin with but when I get into a couple books or tv shows or movies a year like I'm gung-ho about it and I um have I binge the whole thing really quickly. The episodes end like on total cliffhangers where you're like, how can I go to work right now? <laughs> Not knowing what happens next. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend it. And my other recommendations real quick, this is all over the internet. So you've probably seen it, but if, in case you haven't and you're a fan of Joni Mitchell, she um, just performed um, at the Newport Folk Festival. If you Google Joni Mitchell, it'll be the first thing that comes up. She's saying um, both sides now. And it was one of the most beautiful performances I've ever seen. I cried through it. Um, if you followed Joni Mitchell, um, you know that she has dealt with some health problems and she had a brain aneurysm a few years ago. And 
we haven't seen much of her since and it was just the most moving performance it did. I feel like it's miraculous. Um, so go watch it if you're a fan. That's and that's all for me. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have something they would like to share to our viewers? If not, that's oh yeah, Amber, go for it. Well, I was just going to say that I was invited to go see where the crawdads sing, which is based on the bestseller that I actually haven't read. Um, a close friend of mine read it and did not like it, and her review to me kind of made me not want to read it. I have to be honest, but I was invited to go to the movies on a day when it was, you know, 99 degrees. And I thought, yeah, okay, it's going to be cool in the theater. And also it's produced by Reese Witherspoon, who I have found, I really do not have the same reading taste as her. And every time I read one of her book club picks, I do not like it. But that said, I loved Big Little Lies, which she was in a think she may have also produced it and so I thought this is not going to be the worst way to spend two hours on a Sunday and I actually really liked the movie um it's kind of I don't know how the book is again so I can't you know judge it based on the book but um it's kind of slow moving telling the story of um young girl who's abandoned by her parents and raises herself in the marsh of um marsh country of North Carolina and, and then is as a young adult is accused of a murder. And I, I was riveted the whole time. I, I thought it was really good. And um, I think, especially if you read the book and or like um, Reese Witherspoon, I think it would definitely not be the worst thing you could do for two hours of your time. Is she in it? She is not in it. The actress that plays, um, I'm totally blanking on her name, is Daisy Normal Edward people. Jones, I think. Yeah. And Mary I, Yes. I, I'm not sure what else she was in, but she's quite good. I liked her. She was wonderful in Normal People. Oh, oh, okay. So I haven't, I don't think I've seen, I thought I, I've seen, I might've watched the first episode of that and then that makes sense. Yeah, I feel similarly about Reese Witherspoon's book picks, but I feel like when she then adapts those same books, I love what she does with, um, like, visually. I love Big Little Lies. I could take or leave the book. And I'm watching Little Fires Everywhere right now. Um, and the, the book was good, but I'm way more into the show. So, yeah, she's great. All right that's our show thank you to my wonderful colleagues for your recommendations and giving us all some new tv shows to watch um, and books to read uh, again thank you to the friends of the waltham public library for helping us make sure that we can put on programs like this and others definitely check them out we have lots of great things happening at the library this summer um, lots of great big releases are coming out so get those on hold and we will see you all next month. Let's do the awkward YouTube Zoom wave. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Stay cool out there.